Lights. Hello. Welcome to day three of Nappy and the Visionary Track, you guys. How are we holding up? I know, right before lunch, you guys, and we are knocking it out of the park. We are hitting this from every single angle, and um, you are really getting a taste of folks that are at the bleeding edge of uh, various technologies and experiences. So uh, I'm not going to get in the way of this because you are in for a T-R-E-A-T, -E if you know what I mean. I am Amber J. Lawson. I am your host, managing partner of StoryTech, uh, bridging the gap between storytellers and technology. Uh, our next speaker is, um, how do I describe Mark and Neem? <laughs> he is a man that, uh, is uh, just outstanding, a forward thinker at the bleeding edge of uh, data and really evolved over time. The guy was 20, is a 20 year veteran of uh, Sony Music. So he is down with the people and up with data. And uh, so I am, oh my screen, I, I waited too long, it went dead. All right. Uh, so he has been in data I went back in, what, five, six years ago, had a company wired set at the very beginning of like this emergence of data. So he knows it better than anybody. He's evolved that company into what is now Trender, really at the forefront of uh, data and, and distilling it down into usable chunks of content that then we can um, integrate and, and make business decisions from. And so without further ado, the guy who's going to unveil big data to us so that we understand it, Mark Anim. Thank you, Amber. Thanks for that great introduction. Um, I'm kind of doing a, a level set on data as creative and I'd like to wish the NAPTI folks a happy anniversary um, on their 50th and it's, it's really great to be here. So I'm gonna just kind of canter through uh, probably 40 slides in 20 minutes really quickly, but there's a lot to cover and uh, provide a nice level set. So, you know, man's first invention was a story and stories have always been, you know, pro providing the first data point. You can look at the first data point in that cave right there, right? But stories have always increased in complexity and capability over the years. And we now have smart devices to help tell our stories. So. There's more data around stories every day. We process at my company, Trender, we process over a million data points around television per minute right now. And I'm talking about active television shows. So depending on what's on at the night, it can be anywhere between a half a million and a million plus data points a minute from people interacting about what they care about, right? So I'd like to put this into three phases of the three P's of social television. The first phase is passive. It's been where we've been up till now, um, or last five, up until the last five years. You were home, TV was social. That's a cliche, TV has always been social, but it was social at the, at the micro level in the household, right? Where we are now in the last five years, we've moved to a persistent relationship with video and television, right? So we have a constant communication. We have other devices that we're engaging in it. And where it goes is what's really exciting. It's perceptive. It starts to become personalized to you. It's your DVR recordings, not your family's. It knows what your friends are watching and your interest graph is tuning in on. So it's informed TV and it's highly personalized, right? So we've also gone through the lean back, lean forward, and lean in experiences around social television. And ultimately what I really wanna do is sit up straight. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we get there. Um, so we have events that create conversation and that conversation creates a ton of data. Some of this data is used for business intelligence and we provide engagement rankings around television and charts around that at Trender TV. Some of it's used for listening, but where it really gets interesting to me is the content and engagement that we can pull out of data. So how has data actually become creative and content? So there's a number of things that are accelerating the social television marketplace and participatory media is there's more tablets being put into the households this year than uh, you know, home computers. Uh, Mary Mika said that's gonna cross over right now. Um, half of US adults or 29% of US adults are sitting with tablets. I'm not even getting into the smart devices itself of phones, but half of Americans are also gonna be purchasing a TV this year. And that's gonna be a smart TV, right? The reason social data means something to all these things is that social data brings meaning to dumb devices, dumb terminals, smart devices. Smart devices bring are, are become meaningful through social data. 
So there's a number of experiences looking at the data emerging out of this marketplace, right? And there's these experiences around TV, I think I'd like to frame it in, in this way, is that we're connected to our friends with social television, we're connected to intelligence, and that's really smart TV. So that's the, the data that comes up with your, you know, your football scores as you're watching the game and, and, and the league that you're participating in and, and depth that can be around news, it can be around politics. There's transactional, like convenience, I want to buy that, right? And then we have data that's coming in around competitive stuff, so how we compete with TV or TV TV as a game. What's really interesting here is if you look down the T that is in between these boxes, this is what's really taking place. The top of the T is a bunch of data points coming off of small interactions with TV. Little things like a tweet here or a, you know, an interaction here and there. And then if you go down the shaft of the T, you start to get to these deeper experiences where it's, it's much more immersive and, and much more you know, data rich or socially rich. So how we watch TV has changed. And I would argue we're in the middle of probably, whether it's a disruption or an opportunity through disruption, the biggest fundamental change of consuming television since, you know, in the last 50 years. And one of these changes is the device. And you're looking at six different configurations that can be any part of anyone's home right now. And, you know, synchronization is where you like walk out of one room and it picks up into the next room and then you put that down and you go out and it's on your phone. So there's a number of ways to consume this and how do we actually measure those points of attention across devices and services and grow our businesses off of that. So this is a slide from uh, Google's uh, tablet study, if you haven't looked at that, talking about what we've been hearing all week is that there is a convergence between big data, smart devices, and consuming media. You know, I usually like to go through a show of hands to say, so, okay, I'm saying that TV is being transformed. It's uh, a big opportunity, but, you know, I see data that says that, but I'd like to go to the room and do some real-time data because a lot of the data points we're talking about are real-time dial meters that show up on TV shows like The Voice and some of these other things that we're talking about. So is there a transformation really taking place? So I'd love a show of hands if anybody in this room has participated in any of these behaviors. And snacking, which I mean just tasting a little bit of TV, binging, watching whole seasons within a weekend, right? You know, obviously a lot of us are time shifting, and then we have, you know, participating with social. So if you've done any of those things in the last year, would you throw up your hands? Okay, so there is a transformation taking place. So denial is a river in Egypt if we're not paying attention to that transformation, and it's really important. I should be bringing, um, you know, those data points into my presentation right now to make sure I understand you. So this is really what I'm talking about, is that real-time feedback loop. So we look at content, we have it in the center, it's got its own little social graph that's got its own data points, but you have all this engagement around content and then discovery around content. And discovery is where it really gets interesting. But discovery helps you find the content that you're creating. And a lot of that's going to be coming off of social. At CES this year, we debuted discovery with um, MSOs and DISH was in the, on, on the floor at CES showing you the top 10 shows that you that are active right now socially on TV versus the 500 available to you. Now that is broad stroke right now. You will start to see that get down to the top 10 shows my friends are watching right now, right? And hopefully they're your friends in your interest graph versus your social graph because I have plenty of friends I don't want to watch what they want to watch. <laughs> um, so people are seeing things, they're feeling them, they're saying them, and then we can start to predict do, right? Because this data starts to tell you a bunch of different points. And, you know, I always say Twitter's the social heartbeat of, tele of social TV, but you start to look. The persistent relationship is 24-7, 365. So we take this giant cloud of data, Twitter, Facebook, all second screen applications, and then you can process it through this cloud in the middle, that happens to be our trender stack there, where you can start to take out location, intent, sentiment, all sorts of different key um, data points out of it, and then how this impact impacts an industry. So we would think that this data comes in and it, it affects agencies, it affects brands, it affects networks, MSOs, and media companies as a whole. I want to drill down now a little deeper, and now I'm at the network level. And this real-time data informs the entire TV stack. And I'm not talking about, I use the word stack for a reason, because TV is evolving into a digital stack and not just studios, right? And even the studios we just heard about will go back up into the digital platform and into the cloud. So it informs each one of these areas, and there's a specific ROI against it. 
I, I, I put this there to just like slow myself down and say that you don't watch TV alone anymore if you don't want to. Um, so let's go to what are these things are actually impacting. So they impact production on what we make. This data can impact narrative on how we make it. We can certainly understand audience engagement and start to value media based on engagement versus just reach, right? Frequency of conversations, how passionate they were. We can certainly talk about discovery, and I'll, and I'll show you a little bit of discovery in a second. And then, you know, it's a sync social smart world, and that's how we're consuming it. So when we see all these data points, it doesn't mean we always have to use them, but we certainly should learn from them. Here's some examples of data as creative. So we were fortunate enough, and I wanted to be contextual. I'm in Miami. We worked at Telemundo with the Billboard Music Awards last year. Um, this is all data on the screen with the host interacting with the data. And I'll show you a live clip of this. But on the right side is like the most relevant tweet right then. They're also looking at a chart that's moving real time off of data off of Twitter, trying to prioritize the stars coming on the show and how people are feeling about them. You know, they called it El Pulso, or our product's called Trender, but El Pulso uh, was this. Now, these are the social calls to action with the minute-by-minute -minute Nielsen data points. And what we start to see here is the real close correlation to say the highest spikes there were from on-air call-outs from social. So, you know, when we want to map this towards a currency, i.e. gross ratings points, gross engagement points map to gross ratings points. So this is a video of that actual execution. I want to roll this if we can. Friends, tenemos aquí hoy día el pulso tomándole lo que es lo más caliente de la bomba roja está en la posición número 3 en Twitter. En serio? Yes. Trending, buddy. I'm trending? Yeah. Muy buenas noches. Te tengo una gran sorpresa, hermano. Estamos estrenando esta última tecnología llamada El Pulso, gracias a la compañía Trender. Eh, tomando en cuenta todas las conversaciones, todas las menciones que están haciendo ustedes en casa a través de la red social Twitter. Y mira, Daniel, lo que tengo acá. People, posición número uno, Prince Royce. En la dos, tres, Juanes, cuatro, Daniel Sarcos y cinco, Don Omar. Les recuerdo que ustedes en casa pueden ver este show en Telemundo.com okay. a través de sus computadoras, también teléfonos móviles y tabletas y lo que es el pulso. So you started to see there that the data was moving real time, the host was interacting with it real time, and they started to play off each other. Those were like four or five segments during that particular show. That show had the highest ratings they've ever had in, uh, on, in the particular history of airing that. Um, so here's a couple of other data points, stuff that we didn't execute but are being executed out there. Uh, this is a Suits data point where I think it was a flock to unlock on USA. So the more content was unlocked by the more people talking about it. So the more you talked about something, the more you were receiving rewards and getting access to more, more unique content, right? This is a Walking Dead app where it's synced directly to the show. So they're taking data, real-time polling, all sorts of other things, and are, are synced through automatic content recognition, or ACR, um, through the show, and they're pacing with it. So data's in there, informing that experience while they're watching the show. Now we get to discovery, and I always say not the spaceship discovery but this type of discovery where I have to figure out what I want to watch. And we really believe that the, one of the big upsides of all these data points is discovery. And that whether that be discovery of the channels that we just talked about on YouTube or whether that be the discovery on television, a lot of people sit down in front of the television, I forget the stat, but it's you know, north of 50% where they don't know what they want to watch. So if we can inform that through real-time social data, real-time interactive data, we can start to really drive people to where we want. And if you activate, you start to show up on that chart and more people will tune in. So it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy to be playing in that space. I fully believe that this year we will see shows that are fully based on interactive and data a la reality television where shows are just pulling in real-time relationships with the consumers that are watching it and visualizing it. This is a close-up of the dish piece that uh, was showed at, at CES. So they already decided they, you know, NCIS is what they wanted to watch and then they wanted to start to participate in the show with all the different data coming coming out of the social networks. Another way to look at this data, you know, and this is a little bit more on business intelligence, but if you take a network like CW and the Vampire Diaries, super social show, right? Very social, demos perfect for it, highly positive. We can see that if you look down at reach, if you consider followers and Facebook followers and likes part of reach, they're, you know, they're 100 million plus in reach just on social right there. But what gets interesting here is that people are certainly engaged around these shows. That's the last season and you can see the spikes on each episode. 
But when you really look at the data and the conversation around the show, you see that 75% of the conversation around this show is taking place in between episodes, right? So highly active during, but even more active in between. So really big insights there. If you're a marketer, um, you should be able to use this data to say this is what they reacted to and put those clips back into the marketplace. You know, I don't know if anyone was watching uh, CNBC this week when Cal Icon called in and started to do, you know, a smackdown with the host and, and another hedge fund guy. But within minutes of that, it started to do 10x tweets uh, on air while it was happening, and each person discovered that because of Twitter, because it was uh, acting as discovery, and then CNBC did something really smart. They put the clips right back out on Twitter. Did you miss it? Everyone's talking about it. Here it is, right? So you feed that cycle full time, and the data informs that. One, and I have to look at this, but I believe one out of nine people interacted with that show. One out of nine people viewing that show was interacting with it on social. That's a, that's a ridiculous touch point stat, right? We're also seeing plenty of new services emerges, like Zbox is one of them, where they're pulling all sorts of interesting data points. I think the right side of the bottom there is Z tags. That's coming off of closed caption data and driving discovery through that way. Um, that's another tightly synced app that um, has hit the marketplace. So engagement, I'm going to look at Hawaii Five-0. I don't know if anyone noticed what they did about three weeks ago, but they were experimenting. And this is what you need to do right now is use this data to understand what works and doesn't work, right? And they were experimenting with um, calls to action at the end of the show where you could pick the ending, right? That's that spike that happened during that call to action. That's a traditional episode underneath it, right? And they, you know, the highest live plus 18 to 49 ratings this season and, and, and a really nice increase in uh, ratings from the premiere. So whether or not that's the perfect execution because that's really taking creative and using it in different ways, like you have to shoot three endings, there's different burdens with that, you know, it worked, but is it the best? No, we don't know yet. You have to look at a bunch of executions, look at the data around it and see. This was an amazing one, this is a great execution, big applauding for, you know, even participating it. So one, one out of 54 viewers there were uh, interacting with the show or helped predict the outcome. Another example of data is creative, red carpets, uh, KBC in LA, you know, they, they have a, an app called Red Hot right now uh, that they use, so they have it on the iPad, on the iPhone, and on air. This is another quick video execution on how they actually incorporated data into the red carpet broadcast of last year. We could roll this for about 30 seconds. Everything's hot when it comes to the Oscars, but if you want to know what's red hot right now, we've got you covered. Red Hot Right Now is the exclusive live social tracker of On the Red Carpet, tracking all the tweets and Facebook posts about everything Oscars as they happen. Who's causing a fashion buzz and who missed the mark? Or who deserves the gold and who is cheated? You can keep your eye on the Red Hot Right Now chart. Stars and movies move up and down the list in real time. And you can get interactive, too. Dive into the Twitter streams to get details about... You get that, right? But they're, they're using data as creative. They're pulling it into the show real time. It's working real time for them. You know, Weather Channel is another one. This is one we actually worked on with Twitter, where Twitter and Weather Channel wanted to unlock the value of social a couple of years back right now. And we had to go through the challenge of taking a billion tweets every two days, isolating the conversations around weather, understanding the difference between November rain being a Guns N' Roses song versus rain in November, and Miami Heat being a basketball team, and all these other wonderful lexicon challenges, right? Map the location down to the, map the data down to location and they use it in all five areas of their, you know, they're using it in the iPad. That's the on-air view right there. So they're using it in every part. It's the number one, it's, it's front and center of their app and on the front page of their app. So you can go in on their site where you can just type in your zip code and see people talking about weather two feet from you. So on the ground reporting. And sometimes stuff doesn't show up um, through Doppler and everything else. So, you know, floods and stuff like that benefit from on the ground reporting. So data, the opportunity really is social provides a new way to tell old stories. And in the end, the stories are what matters the most. So that adds more context to these stories and certainly plays off that complexity and the capabilities that have been growing since stories are around. That's a picture of Joseph Campbell with a hero with a thousand faces. But I think it's, it's, it's summed up better like this. You have data then you have information, and then you have presentation, and then you have knowledge, right? So it, it, it goes a long way till you get that way. But if you bake that cake and eat it, 
it's a TV party tonight. So data is the new creative, and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to be working with. Thank you. I think I kept that to 20, before, too. Before Mark uh, hops off the stage, did anybody have any questions for Mark? Some insights, some deeper dives? Raise your hand. Great. Uh, that was an awesome presentation, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Yeah! A lot of information. Uh, the, what, what I would love to, to speak more to, given the audience, is something you said about how there was a lot of conversation trending in between episodes and uh, in between seasons. How important is it for producers to, uh, to embrace extending their storylines year round? Uh, and what kind of data are you seeing in that capacity? Well, the, the data clearly says that the audience doesn't go away when the show's not on. It's like I grew up in the music industry. I didn't stop liking the band if they were in between releasing albums, right? But traditionally, television does the, the field goals, and then you come between seasons, and then you ramp right back up again. But your audience hasn't gone away, so that's a giant opportunity to grow that audience from the marketing side. Now, from the storytelling side, you can take all this data and understand what plot, character, and other things resonated from the first season, have those brand, you know, what I'm hearing from brands, they want to be at the point of engagement. They want to do these either transmedia or narratives in between seasons, but they need to understand the best way to approach it. And social data can certainly give a good optic into that and then tell you where to focus in between those two. Because you your audience doesn't go away, you shouldn't go away, and it should be building versus going like this and then back up again and like this and back up again. That's a, that's a long, hard road to keep touching bottom on. Amen to that. Who else has a question? Right back. Um, for producers like me that have a bunch of content syndicated, um, maybe on like cable networks, and I do a little sports show. When you say a call of action that they did and they got a big response, and they use that call of action at the end of the show, I'm just wondering what that call of action might have been, and would it be good during the program, maybe between before commercial break or something? put a little lower third that puts your Twitter info or your Facebook thing, like what did you think of that fish or what did you think of this location or where would you like us to go next month? Something, are those the kind of calls yeah. of action? Yeah, and there's varying degrees. I mean, at the most minimal call to action is like the bottom third violate a hashtag, like you were saying, right? Or putting a tweet there, right? But the Telemundo and the other examples I shown, they were using the, you know, the calls to action on air as like segments. So if you're into this, tell us or build it in. You see deeper integration on shows like The Voice where it's, it's really clear those calls to action. So I think you have a number between one and a hundred. I think you gotta be careful, depending on the type of show you have, um, not to piss off the massive passives, because there's plenty of people who just sit in front of that TV and just want to be numb and don't want, you know, a data overload. So that's why those second screens are highly valuable. But there's specific shows, news, politics, competitive reality that are just way over indexing in this space where calls to action, you know, are expected. So, you know, depending on your demographic, you know, when I was in music, I used to have a mobile mailing list and I remember I worked at Columbia Records, you know, the Bruce Springsteen list you almost never mailed unless it was like earth shattering information. My urban artists, they wanted at least 50 text messages a day or we weren't super serving them. So like, you know, there's, there's that number between one and 10 and I think it really comes down to the director, the producer and the nature of the show and how to do it. But at very minimal, you should be hashtagging or doing calls to action to whatever integration you have. Awesome. Is there one more question? This is our last one. We have only five minutes until our next visionary takes the stage. So here's our last question from Mark and Neeb. Hi, Mark. Um, you, you mentioned that you can see interactive being the starting point for the creation of, of a show, perhaps this year. I mean, how do you envisage that working? So as opposed to using kind of the second screen around a piece of content that's already there, actually using you know, Twitter or whatever network it, it is as the starting point in the creative. So, uh, you know, I could, 
I, every night when I look at a show like, you know, E.T. or Access Hollywood or any of these shows, I think of each module and most of it's reacting to stars and, and fans reacting to that. If you built out like a bunch of different pods to say this is what happened today. So today's show for me, I would be, you know, taking the pulse of America on Congress right now talking about gun control and it's on, you know, CNN and every network and they're debating that right now. Well, that's what they're saying. What is the voice of the people there? And that's a three minute segment, right? And you could go like that across what people are talking about and understanding, engaging the pulse of America. That's one way. I also think that you will see pure interactive play shows where data is driving the show. It's competitive. It's, you know, Jeopardy, everybody's playing at home and, and the winner gets the screen. Um, so there, there's a number of formats that will emerge out of this. It's very nascent, but, you know, we're starting to see it build into parts and parcels of programming. And ultimately, I see both advertising and content and certain calibers of advertising and content all having an interactive real-time component to it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank this you, guys. Really awesome. Happy nap. We have only four minutes until our last visionary of the day. So uh, quick reload, and we are back. <laughs>